Think so? Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Come on in and grab a seat. How are you feeling today? That's the wrong answer. You're supposed to say, super! That was a funny joke. Y'all don't get that. Well, I feel super, and Randy's got some super songs for us to sing, and it's going to be a super Sunday indeed uh, today. On behalf of the leadership of our church, I want to welcome you to the Pinnacle Church of Christ, where we are living and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Anytime we can get together to worship in spirit and in truth, it's always super, uh, whether it's Super Bowl Sunday or not. So glad to see everyone here this morning. Uh, today, as we start, want to deviate from the norm just a little bit, and we've got a very special announcement. Brother uh, Curtis Eubanks is going to come and uh, give us some information that we need to know. So Curtis, if you would at this time. Good morning to everyone. Well, I've got some info, and this is purely informational. Uh, next week you'll see more about this, but this is concerning our Easter Seals uh, Easter Basket Project. You know, last year was kind of a wipeout, but uh, we've been in conversation this past week, and uh, we've worked out some details, but we'll have to follow guidelines much like we did at Christmas. Um, I will wait till next week to give you a little more information, but we're going to press forward with the caveat that there's about 36 kids, and Ms. Brita is splitting those kids with us in one more team. So that limits the number of kids uh, that we've typically worked with. So it's going to be on a first come, first basis, just like it was at Christmas time. So I apologize for that. I know there's a lot of hearts bent toward building these baskets for these kids at CRC. But we are in business, and uh, next week I hope to have sign-up sheets and the children and the names and young adults as well this year. So uh, bear with us, and uh, I look forward to everybody jumping in and helping. See you all later. Thank you, Curtis. Appreciate that good information. Welcome also to those that are joining us via uh, our live stream. We've got a growing number of folks that tune in regularly to be a part of um, the worship service on live stream and also on uh, Facebook and YouTube. If you're on either of those platforms, be sure and give us a like on Facebook or uh, go ahead and subscribe on the YouTube channel. We would appreciate that so much. And I would be remiss in my duty if I didn't say a word about uh, the brothers that are on the AV team that work with us. They work so hard uh, to try to keep everything going. And so we really appreciate uh, Steve and Dave and Ronnie and Jeremy, all those that are working uh, on our AV team to uh, make sure that we come across in living color. They make me look good, actually, so uh, that's what we really appreciate. Uh, those um, at home, we know that there are some that are going through uh, some difficulties, and the time may not quite be right uh, to be here in person with us. We understand that. We, we really do. But things are getting better. Each day, we're thankful that we're making progress step by step. Now, listen, we're not out of the woods yet, and so we all need to maintain our vigilance and do our part to stop the spread. But when the time is right for you, uh, we want you to know that there is a place for you here at the Pinnacle Church of Christ. Um, don't forget about our online content. You see it displayed on the board. Our services on Sunday morning are live streamed. But then we have the second watch of the day, our Sunday night sermon, and it is a wonderful opportunity uh, to get in on more teaching from the Word. It goes right along with the reading from our daily Bible, and that's at 5 p.m. on Sunday evening. And then Wednesday class discussions. We're also trying to make sure that uh, something is taught, something is discussed out of the daily Bible reading, and uh, that certainly makes it interesting for us as we try to keep up with those daily readings, and then we're able to discuss that on Wednesday. There's a continuity uh, that certainly is, is very good. Thursday, we have our uh, Thursday class devotional, and we're exploring this theme, what does it take to wait on the Lord? And so all of those things are designed with you in mind. Hope that you'll take advantage uh, of that. We also want to um, let you know that we are excited. Um, this week has been just a super week for more reasons than one. Uh, on last Sunday afternoon, uh, we had one to um, put their Lord on in the waters of baptism. Brother 
uh, Terry, uh, Clay Witter, uh, made his decision to uh, be baptized into Christ. And we are just excited to have Terry uh, as a new brother in Christ. Terry, come on up here, man. You know this is life's most embarrassing moment. Come on up here, brother. Terry, we are so excited um, about the decision that you've made to start this new chapter of your life in the Lord. And um, we just want to present you with this Bible. Uh, there are some things written inside from Chuck and from me. And we want you to know that as you begin this journey, your brothers and sisters are right here for you. And uh, just continue to walk with the Lord. We're very, very proud of you. Well, thank you. Give him a hand. We are so excited that we had another uh, baptism on uh, yesterday. We had a sister who was baptized uh, into Christ. And we wanted to make sure that she had the time to let her family uh, know about this before we, we make a formal announcement. But great things are happening here uh, at Pinnacle, and we're so thankful for that. One quick final announcement. Um, next Sunday, the 14th, uh, in addition to it being Valentine's Day, fellas, fellas, I'm just warning you, okay. They're doing some um, construction. The word is that the highway department will be doing some work out on um, I-430, the bridge across the, uh, from Maumel to, to um, Little Rock uh, will be closed. Uh, there's a graphic up on the board. You may not be able to see it, but check your uh, papers, your news sources. We'll try to get you more information about that. Also, if you're coming uh, from the south, uh, the Cantrell exit will be closed. And so it'll make a little interesting um, navigation for us. But be thinking about alternate routes uh, to get here to church next Sunday. And so we wanted to make sure that you're aware of that. We'll try to say a little bit more about that out on our social media, our Facebook page and whatnot. But keep that in mind and, and stay abreast of that so that uh, you will be aware on next Sunday, the 14th. Finally, Please remember all of those who have requested prayer. We've got a number of individuals who uh, have requested prayer as they go through uh, surgeries and recovering from uh, different situations. And this morning, uh, as Randy gets ready to come to lead us in song, let's go to God in prayer on behalf of our brothers and sisters. Gracious Father, we are truly thankful for this, this wonderful Lord's Day. Uh, Father, we are so thankful that you've given us the opportunity to make our way out, to worship you in spirit and in truth. And as we worship and sing songs of praises, Father, we just know that uh, your presence will be here with us. You have said in your word that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, there you would be in the midst of them. And we know that your presence is here. Father, we ask for uh, healing for those that are going through times of illness. We, we ask for comfort, Lord, for those that are going through times of loss. Most of all, we just pray that you would continue to guide and direct us as we live lives that are pleasing and acceptable to you. Forgive us of our sins. Give us a home in heaven with you. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Randy? Good to see you. Good morning. I tell you what, it's getting full in here, Chuck. It's, it's kind of a big circle of folks here. It's good to see. I think we're increasing our numbers a little bit each week. Thank you for being here. Let's praise our Father in heaven today in songs. We sing hallelujah, praise Jehovah. And tell me the story of Jesus for the stand. Turney will lead our communion meditation. And Tim Hamilton will close us in prayer. Let's stand together as we start with hallelujah, praise Jehovah. <clears throat> hallelujah, praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels praise proclaim. All his hosts together praise him. Sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye heaven of heavens and ye floods above the sky. Let them pray. Just give Jehovah for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, far above the earth and sky. Let them praise his gift, Jehovah, they were made at his command, and forever he established. 
His decree shall ever stand from the earth, O oh, praise Jehovah. All ye floods, ye dragons, all fire and hail and snow and vapors, stormy winds that hear him call. Let them pray, just give Jehovah, for his name alone is high and his glory is exalted and his glory is exalted and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. You sit, please. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they were. Come this birth, glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings on earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most prayer. Sweet is that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, right? Being in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him. Tell how he lived again. Love in the story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper. Love paid the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus. Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Brother Stan Turney will lead us in our meditation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before your table this morning to commune together, Lord, just thank you for your son who died for our sins. And Father, just help us reflect back. Christ hung on the cross, Calvary. Bless this bread as we partake. Let us take it in a manner pleasing. Thank you again for your son who died for our sins. Amen. Let's pray. Father, as we continue this communion service, Lord, just bless this fruit of the vine that signifies Christ's blood that he shed for our sins. Help us to take in a manner that's pleasing you, Lord, your son's name. Amen.
As we move on to our giving part of this service, uh, you can uh, drop your contribution in the basket in the back there, or you can uh, go online and uh, do the online giving. Let's pray. Father, just want to thank you so much for all the blessings that you've given us. Lord, just thank you for Pinnacle Church. Thank you for everyone here, and thank you for all the blessings that you give us, and help us give in a cheerful heart. In your son's name, amen. Let's open our Bibles together to Leviticus chapter 9, or if you have your daily Bibles, that's page 150. We are glad that you are here on this brisk, crisp Lord's Day. In this last seven days, I've had the privilege of assisting two precious souls to be born again of the water and the Spirit. And it's always remarkable to me that God, how shall we say this, that God decides to go slumming and hangs out with the likes of us. That's really about the best way that you can put it. God, who is infinitely greater than ourselves, condescends and lets us be participants in some small way in the great work that he's doing in the world. I was reminded of that yesterday as we shared a few verses out of Romans chapter 6, and we see that the three components of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again, We get to reenact those things when a person is baptized into Christ. We've died to sin, we're buried in the water, and in the same way that God brought Jesus out in triumph over the tomb, that person comes up out of that water to start living a new life. And friends, that's nothing to do with us. That is everything to do with God. That God would let us be participants in that reenactment of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus is a remarkable blessing, how good God is to us all. Medieval theologian Thomas Aquinas created one of the greatest intellectual achievements in all of Western civilization in his Summa Theologica. It is a massive work consisting of some 38 treatises 3,000 articles, and 10,000 objections. Aquinas set out to gather into one coherent whole all truth, touching on anthropology, science, ethics, psychology, political theory, and theology, all under the aegis of God. But on December the 6th, 1273, Aquinas abruptly stopped his work. While worshiping, he caught what he termed a glimpse of eternity, which suddenly made him realize that all of his efforts to describe God fell so far short that he decided never to write again. When a secretary tried to encourage him to resume his writing, he replied, Reginald, I can do no more. Such things have been revealed to me that all I have written seems as so much straw. Even the greatest human minds cannot fathom the greatness of God. In Leviticus 22 Beginning in verse 31, the Bible says, Keep my commands and follow them. Do not profane my holy name. I must be acknowledged as holy by the Israelites. I am the Lord who makes you holy and who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. The Hebrew word here translated as holy is karash. Applied to God, it simply means that he is pure, that he is sacred, that he is like no other. Karash is the sphere 
of what is considered to be sacred. So here's the question before us today. How are a bunch of sinful, flawed, profane, unholy people supposed to enter the sphere of the sacred? How? Well, that would be the question that would be posed by the men of Bet Shemesh. When God put 70 of them to death for looking inside the Ark of the Covenant, they asked this question, who can stand in the presence of the Lord, this holy God? A.W. Tozer says, holy is the way God is. To be holy, he does not conform to a standard. He is the standard. He is absolutely holy with an infinite, incomprehensible fullness of purity that is incapable of being other than what it is. Because he is holy, all his attributes are holy. That is, whatever we think of as belonging to God must be thought of as holy. The challenge of an unholy people approaching a holy God was daunting. And we could say is daunting because nothing's changed. And yet the holy God had a plan to bring these people along to instill within themselves a sense of what holiness is all about, and to let them know that coming into the presence of God was not to be considered an irrelevant or trifling matter, but it was the most important thing that mankind could do. So as we've gone through our daily readings, we see a pattern developing. And here's how the pattern begins. It begins with God declaring what the holy things are. In Exodus 25, beginning in verse 8, the Lord says, Have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. The tabernacle was God's presence within his people in the sense of being localized. This represents in a very special way God dwelling or living among his people, a visible symbol that he was their God. This was where Israel could worship and make atonement for the breaking of the covenant. The tabernacle would provide the means by which the holy, transcendent God would be present with his people, tabernacling or tenting among them. This is the same thought that exists in John chapter 1 and verse 14, when in describing Jesus, it says, the word became flesh and tabernacled among them. In the same way that God was coming down to dwell with Israel, Jesus came in human form, to dwell with us. And the worship of the tabernacle would offer a way by which a sinful people could maintain fellowship with God. Our recent daily readings have mentioned a cornucopia of details. If some of you feel a bit overwhelmed by those details, Take a deep breath, roll up your sleeves, and tackle them again. They matter. I've already had a couple people say, yeah, I just skip over all that. No, you don't skip over all that. You stay with it, okay? Believe me, there'll be a payoff on the other end. But these recent readings that we've been involved in describe the many different items of religious significance which were part of the worship at the tabernacle. And sometimes, since a picture is worth a thousand words, we'll offer up a few pictures here. First is the ark. You know about that because it's been in movies, okay? But everybody knows how this turns out. 
like the men of Bet Shemesh, the Nazis look into it and God melts their faces. Okay, so you've, you've, so we're, we're good on that. The Ark, obviously, is a wooden box overlaid in gold with great, great detail. That's probably a pretty decent representation of what it looked like with the cherubim and their wings overspreading the Ark. But this Ark told the people that God is living among us. And the Ark would contain, obviously, in years to come, a handful of items that would be sacred to the Israelites. On top of the Ark would be the mercy seat. That is where God would come and, in a figurative way, meet with his people. There would be the table, which is kind of the back, back one. The table describing the table that was used for the daily sacrifices and ministrations that would come before God on the part of the people. The lampstand, even today, uh, has maintained an iconic image in all of Judaism with the menorah. You have the altar of burnt offerings, which it's just overwhelming to read about this steady stream of sacrifices and all of the animals that would be offered up, reminding the people that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And the life of the body is in the blood, Leviticus 17 and verse 11. There would be special garments for the priests as well. We'll talk about that in just a second here. There's the altar of incense, uh, which it, did you notice that there is a formula or prescription for the incense itself that God gives? There's the bronze laver, which would be used for purification rituals and washing. Then there is within the tabernacle itself the veil and the most holy place that the priest could go in once a year. By the way, it would develop over the course of time that the priest in his vestments had on bells, kind of so that, you know, you could hear him coming, and he would go into the holy place on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, with a rope tied around his ankle. You know why? In case he had a heart attack and died, no one else could go in there, and they would drag him out. Now, every detail imaginable is prescribed by the Lord, no matter how small. I will readily confess, this is not my favorite section of the Bible to read. It's important, it's all important, but I get a little bit overwhelmed by the detail. How many times have you seen this phrase, blue purple and scarlet yarn, finely twisted linen, make a covering of ram skins dyed red in the hides of sea cows. And by about the hundredth time I've read this, I'm like, okay, I, I get it. I, I get it. But here's the other thing. I don't have any abilities in those areas at all. I couldn't make a birdhouse, much less a table and all these elaborate vestments, the, the priest's garments. All of this detail, what's the important point about this? Here's the important thing. There is no detail too small regarding worship that escapes the notice of God. It all matters to him. We live in a time, well, you know, I'll just come to God and give him whatever. Is that your final answer? You know, the first time an act of worship is ever recorded in Scripture was with Cain and Abel, and half of the participants got it wrong. Think that that's helpful? I would suggest that maybe over half of the participants today continue to get it wrong. When we come to God and say, this is what we're going to offer to God, and he's just going to have to accept it, you might as well skip it, because God has never ordained worship with that spirit and with that attitude. There's an example of these details that's seen in the priestly garments, and you see the picture of this. This would have been something. When this guy walks into the room, you can see he's different, and that was kind of the point. Okay, can you imagine today if people were just left to come up with something? We'd have somebody in jeans and a Hawaiian shirt and flip-flops. Well, that's just what we we're most, most comfortable in. It was never about what made people comfortable. It was about what did God expect. 
And this carried with it the connotation that there's something special going on. This is not business as usual. This is not just, you know, we've got a to-do list and we're checking them off as we go down. This is the to-do list. Coming before the Lord in holiness. There's something different going on. That's the point of these holy things. God is trying to get the message across to a people that when you come before me, you've got to be thoughtful, you've got to be intentional, you've got to be reverent, and you've got to do exactly what I've asked you to do. There's no substitute for that. So God declares these holy things. So when you're getting caught up in the details and you're in danger of missing the forest for the trees, don't miss the important point here. God wants what he wants done the way he wants it done. And he's not any different today. Here's a second observation that we can make. Of these holy things that are declared, there is holy care that is demanded. In your reading, you probably noticed, and this is one of those things, if you're not careful, it'll just fly right by. You know what the original plan was for the priesthood that would minister on behalf of Israel to God? It was to be the firstborn of every family, the firstborn males. You're thinking, well, that's not what happened. It was changed. Why the Lord did that, we don't know. But in place of the firstborn from every family, God chooses the tribe of Levi to assist Aaron in serving as priests. Now, why was that? Maybe keeping it in the family was one reason. Probably another reason that the Scripture gives is that when Israel goes off into wanton immorality, who are the ones that rally to the side of the Lord and execute judgment on the wrongdoers? The Levites, okay? And that seemed to be something that was impressive to the Lord. But in any way, the Lord has been extremely specific about the design and construction of the tabernacle and its furnishings, and he does the same with the service of this tribe of priests, the care that they are to carry out and the faithfulness that they are to exhibit. Here are a couple of points that deserve mention. First, the Levites are to be purified before serving. They just don't come in from doing something else and just uh, maybe throw something on and that's it. There is an elaborate series of steps that they're to follow before they come into the presence of the Lord. Interestingly enough, this is going to carry over even to the time of Christ. When we see after the ascension of Jesus into heaven on the day of Pentecost that there are some 3,000 men who are baptized into Christ, people have wondered, well, where did this happen? They didn't have a church building. They didn't have a baptistry. Where would this occur? Outside of the temple walls, there were some 90 mikvahs, ceremonial baths. What some people miss, not only were the priests required to be purified before coming into the temple to worship God, all of the worshipers had to as well. You had to go and be ceremonially cleansed in this mikvah, then put your clothes on, then go into the temple. Not until. The Lord was very particular about the purification rites of the Levites. Among those Levites that would serve, only those between 25 and 50 were able to serve. Any of you feel discriminated against there? I and mean, we could file an age discrimination suit against the Lord. I could say, Lord, I'm, I'm only 57. I only feel 77. But, uh, you know, no, this is, this is the matter. 25 and 50, those are the ages. There are specific responsibilities given out to the sons, uh, the three sons of Aaron and the Levites. The Gershonites were responsible for the care of the tabernacle, its tent, its coverings, its curtains, its ropes. The Kohathites were responsible for the care of the ark, the table, the lampstand, the altars, and the other articles of the sanctuary. Just a special word about the Kohathites. This is going to come up again and again. We talked about the men of Bet Shemesh looking in the ark and dying. 
In 2 Samuel chapter 6, there's the, ca- the occasion of bringing the ark that had been captured by the Philistines and then had been put in cold storage in a fellow's house into Jerusalem. And they took great care to bring the ark into Jerusalem. You remember what happened? They put it on a brand new cart and oxen that had never pulled anything before, and they came in, and the ark, the oxen stumbled. The ark was about to slip. Uzzah reaches out and touches the ark to keep it from crashing to the ground. And what does God do to reward him? He kills him. And David is just losing his mind. He said, you know, he meant, well, Lord, why would you do this? And then finally, David does something, something that he should have done at the start. He goes back and he looks at the owner's manual. He looks at the original instructions. You know what they say? You've read them this week. You should know. On page 154, number seven, they're giving out carts and they're giving out oxen for the Gershonites and for the Merarites. And this group gets this many carts, and that group gets that many carts. Guess how many carts the Kohathites got? None. Zero. Bupkis. You know why? It says in Numbers chapter 4, pages 163 and 64, the Kohathites, in, re- regarding all of these things, are to do all of the what? Carrying. Not pulling not hauling, carrying. You remember the poles? You bring this stuff in with the poles. You know what people would say today? Well, you know, why is the Lord so picky? Friends, (laughs) he's the object of worship. Seriously? That would be my like my dog questioning the manner in which I feed her every day. Actually, that's a bad analogy. My dog and I are a lot closer, probably, than the Lord and I are, okay? The Lord is miles and miles and miles above me. I'm not to question anything that the Lord does. When the Lord says he wants the Kohathites to carry these things, you carry them. That's what you do. That's going to cause problems later. But friends, it's going to cause problems anytime the Lord asks us to do something. We decide we've got a way to build a better mousetrap even though we do not. The Merarites were appointed to take care of the frames of the tabernacle. It's crossbars, posts, bases, and all of the equipment and everything related to its use. Now, Moses and his sons, and Aaron and his sons, were to camp east of the tabernacle in front of the tent of meeting. They're responsible for the care of the sanctuary on behalf of the Israelites. Now, listen to this. Anyone else other than these specified people who approached the sanctuary was to be put to death. This is serious business, folks. Okay, it's not like the nonsense that passes for religious devotion in 2021. When I'll just come before God any old way and I'll offer him any old thing and I'll do what I want to do and you'll do what you want to do because there are many paths to God and God accepts anyone who's sincere, and blah, 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 blah. You don't see any of that here. There are holy things that are declared. There is holy care that is demanded. And when that doesn't work out, that leads us to step three. There's holy anger that's displayed. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense. And they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, contrary to his command. So fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Moses then said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke of when he said, Among those who approach me I will show myself holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. Aaron remained silent. You know what probably happened here? Because very close to this section of text is a new demand, a new commandment to be followed. That is that the priests are not to have any intoxicating beverages when they come and perform their duties. 
you add one plus one and you come up with the idea that these two sons of Aaron probably were drunk when they went in there and did this. You say, well, that's not good. No, it's not. Imagine that someone gets up like Stan did a minute ago and leads us in our Lord's Supper meditation, or I get up and preach, or John gets up and preaches. By the way, we're drunk while we're doing that. You think that would be an affront to God? Would that be an insult to you? Yeah, it would. This is even greater. And the Lord's not playing games, friends. The Lord lights his own fires. Nadab and Abihu didn't understand that, apparently, but they would. And so would the rest of Israel. But there's one question that should have been asked then, and it needs to be asked today. Does God mean what he says? That seems to be a constant tug of war that people have. Well, you know, does he really expect us to carry out all of these instructions just as he commands? And why can't we substitute this for that and that for this and generally make whatever changes we deem preferable? Why not? I'll ask Nadab and Abihu. I've heard leaders in churches across our country And when they're asked to give an explanation for why they don't have communion on the first day of the week, you know what they say? Well, we're trying to bring in outsiders, and that's a non-starter with outsiders. In other words, the Lord's Supper is too depressing. It's dead air. You're talking about death and blood and sacrifice. Nobody wants to hear that. How does that fit in with an up-with-people worship service? doesn't. It doesn't at all. But again, the question, for whom is the worship service designed to begin with? Is it for me? Is it for you? It's for God. You realize that worship is a spectator sport, but not like most people think. Most people think that the ones in the audience, you're the spectators and I'm the performer. No. We are all the performers, and God is the spectator. That's what worship is about. It's not about what will play in Peoria. It's not about what do the people want. It's not about what's most seeker-friendly. It's about pleasing God. It's always been about pleasing God. You know, I'm somewhat sympathetic to these sons of Aaron, not the drunk part. That's just positively idiotic, but they probably thought, well, you know, but right before this happened, when all of the priests were set aside for service to God, fire came out from the Lord and consumed the sacrifice, and the people thought that was the greatest thing they'd ever seen in their lives. So maybe Nadab and Abihu just thought, well, you know, man, God can do that. He can use this fire. He can use that fire. Fire's fire, right? So we'll offer up this fire. Unauthorized fire. Do you know the New Testament says a lot about that kind of impudent, irreverent behavior? We're told in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 6, do not go beyond the things that are written. We're told in 2 John, anyone who runs ahead and does, goes beyond the commandments, does not have Christ, these things still matter. Maybe they thought, though, it didn't matter what they did as long as they were sincere. Maybe they thought that since God didn't say you can't offer unauthorized fire, that it would be okay. Maybe they thought that fire wasn't a salvation issue. You ever hear that today in the church? Well, that's not a salvation issue. What's not? Uh, This or this or this. I asked one person that said that to me. I said, would you do me a favor? And they said, what? I said, write down a list of the things that are salvation issues, just so I'll know, because I'm not smart enough to deduce between the two. 
If God says to do it, I would assume that we're supposed to do it. And you all, well, this matters, and that doesn't matter, that doesn't matter, this matters. I, I don't get that. I had lunch with a fellow that's been preaching for four decades, graduate with several degrees of our Christian colleges, smart man on a lot of levels. And we were having lunch, and he was talking about some of our more conservative brethren in Churches of Christ. He said, you know, every time you hear these guys preach, he said, they always like to bring up Nadab and Abihu and Uzzah and things like that. I'm like, yeah, your point? And he said, what does that have to do with anything? I don't know that you got to be much of a Bible scholar to figure out what that has to do with anything. God wants what he wants done the way he wants it done. That's what it has to do with anything. So if we're going to worship the Lord today, how are we going to approach this? We're going to try to come as close as possible to the blueprint that God gives us, recognizing that we're never going to get everything perfectly. We don't. We're human beings. We fall and stumble at many points. But when we see that baptism translates a person from being lost to putting them into Christ, that's what we're going to teach. When we see that baptism is by immersion, because that's when you reenact the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that's what we're going to teach. When we see that the first century church sang, but there's no record of playing instruments, that's what we're going to do. We're going to sing. When we see that the early Christians built their gatherings on the first day of the week around the communion, in which they would reflect on the body and blood of Jesus. That's what we're going to do. When we see that the church is organized with elders looking over the flock, that's what we're going to do. Okay? Do we do all of this perfectly? Doubtful. Does that relinquish from us the responsibility of trying to follow God? No, it doesn't. Listen to this again. We started the service with it. We'll end it today. Among those who approach me, I will show myself holy. In the sight of all the people, I will be honored. The question is this. Will we honor through our conduct and through our lives the true and the living God who alone is holy? I can't answer that for you, nor you for me. But may God bless us with a heart that seeks to honor him and to be obedient to his call. Let's pray together. Our Father, we recognize just how far you brought humanity. Father, in using the law as a school teacher to bring Israel into a sense of what is holy and what is sacred, to Father replacing those sacrifices of animals with the sacrifice of your Son, whose blood cleanses us from sin once for all. Father, we recognize that we are in no means worthy in any way of coming before you. But Father, we come before you because of the blood of Jesus covering our sins. And Father, we're thankful for bringing us into a sense of your presence. Father, help us to have that sense of what is holy. And as we live lives in a decidedly unholy world, Father, we pray that we always look to you and recognize that you are different from anything and anyone. Father, we pray that our hearts are always turned toward you all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My friend, if you're subject to the invitation of Jesus, if there's anything that you need that he can provide, we invite you to respond to his call. Won't you come as we stand and sing? Hark the gentle voice of Jesus fall tenderly upon your ear. Sweet his cry of love and pity calleth, turn and listen, stay and hear. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. 
Take his yoke, for he is meek and lowly. Bear his burden, to him turn. He who calleth is the master holy. He will teach if you will learn. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. Then his loving, tender voice, obeying, bear his yoke, his burden take. Find the yoke his hand is on you, laying light and easy for his sake. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, lean upon your dear Lord's breast. Ye that labor and are heavy laden, come and I will give you rest. Would you be seated, please? In just a moment, Brother Tim's going to lead us in a dismissal prayer, then Randy will lead us in another verse or two of a song. But, uh, Tim, we want you to mention in a special way our newest member here, Shirley Mott. Shirley wants to be identified with the Pinnacle family here, Shirley, we're so thankful for your good heart, and we're glad to have you on board with us. Tim, come and lead us. Let us pray. Dear God, we're thankful for this morning that we could be together and to worship you and praise you, Father. We pray a special blessing on Shirley, that you'll bless her and be with her in, in identifying with us and living for you, Father. Father, we're mindful of others who may be hurting today. Maybe they're in need of special blessings, Father. We pray that you would please be with them. And Father, we pl pray that as we go through this new week that you would direct our paths. Please help us to... Uh, Look for ways to be of service to others. Help us to live our lives in a way that others can see, see that we're living for you, Father. And as we close, we just want to thank you for your son. We want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you for this avenue of prayer. And Father, we want to thank you for your church. We know we fall short, and we're sorry for that. And we just ask that you please forgive us of our shortcomings. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Glad to have you, Shirley. Welcome aboard. Let's give her a hand. Let's have a great dear. It's good to have her. Good to have her. Thanks for being here with us. Good, good. Sing and be happy is going to be our last song. Thank you for being here today. Hope your worship was inspirational to your Spiritual life, you're going to be a better Christian in the next few days to come. Got a big Super Bowl afternoon. Some of you will be eating uh, wings and pizza and <clears throat> all that stuff. I know I will some. But at 5 o'clock, at 5 o'clock, don't forget, Chuck will be preaching to us on, on our Facebook Live and YouTube. So move away from Super Bowl for a few minutes and listen to Chuck at 5. So thank you for being here. Let's stand together and we'll sing. Ronnie, let's sing the first verse only of this song. Sing and be happy. <clears throat> If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem gray all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend. Trust in His promises, grand. Sing, you be do the rest along to the good. Trust Him who leads you. He will keep your soul let all be faithful look to him and pray lift your voice and praise him in song sing and be happy today have a great sunday thank you for being here
Hey, good Sunday evening to you once again. We're glad that so many of you are tuned in this evening for our Sunday night sermon. Uh, we are very thankful for um, God moving us forward on into this new year of 2021. And as the calendar changes and we move into the month of February, we are thankful and hopeful and excited uh, that in the future, good things will come about. But until then, we are also thankful for the technology that allows us to come into your homes uh, each Sunday evening. And we have another great lesson uh, tonight. Our scripture reading for the night's lesson will come from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 14, beginning with these words. For the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshiper, once purified, would have no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have pre prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me, to do your will, O God. Previously saying, Sacrifice and burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first, that he may establish the second. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool, for by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sacrificed. Let's go to God in prayer this evening. Gracious Father, we are so thankful for your word, for the pages of this sacred book that we are able to find the guidance and the leading that we stand in need of. And we pray, Father, that as we learn more about your word and your will for us, we will be able to live lives that are pleasing and acceptable to you. Pray that you would be with us this night, and Father, with all the days of our lives, we ask this prayer in Jesus' name, and for his sake we pray, amen. Chuck? I would echo John's words and thanking all of you for joining us this evening. I'd also ask a favor of those of you, if you've been with us all, all the way to this moment, this is going to be a lesson tonight that I think will help provide a framework as we go forward in the weeks and months uh, to come in our Old Testament readings and also into the new, as John just shared from us uh, from the Hebrews reading. But if you could uh, take out uh, something to write with, uh, might be an iPad in your case, might be a tablet and a piece of paper. If you're like me, it might be a legal pad and one of those real good pens that Jan Fowler uh, sends my way. But you might want to write some things down because we're talking about some weighty concepts tonight that will impinge on so much of the rest of Scripture as we deal with the concept of exploring uh, the priesthood. What is this concept? What is this idea? What is this entity uh, as we come across it in the pages of the Old Testament. Well, the theme of priests and priesthood is prominent throughout the Scriptures. We see it in the New Testament, but we really see it in the Old Testament. We come into conflict with the idea of priest in the book of Genesis, and there's going to be some uh, already some disparate ideas of what constitutes a priesthood there between God's people, the patriarchs, and the Egyptians that they'll come in contact with. But the role is going to linger on through the New Testament. Jesus lived under uh, the priesthood that was present in Jerusalem. And even today, as Christians, we celebrate the priesthood of all believers, which in relatively recent terms 
all the way back to the 1500s when Martin Luther helped popularize that phrase, that would be something that the world would be more familiar with. But the office of the priest is mentioned 700 times in the Old Testament and approximately 60 times in the New Testament, which marks it, obviously, as a subject of great significance and importance. So as we begin, let's ask the obvious question. What is a priest? A priest, in effect, is a mediator between God and man. He offers sacrifices to God on behalf of man and administers other worship obligations that people feel unworthy to offer personally. Maybe the closest thing to a definition is found in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 1. There the Bible says, For every high priest being taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. The presence of a priesthood has been characteristic of virtually every society that the world has ever seen. The ancient Assyrians had priests. The ancient Babylonians had priests. When Abram was returning from the rescue of his nephew Lot, he encounters Melchizedek, who was not only the king of Salem, more than likely an antecedent of Jerusalem, but he was also a priest of God Most High. Abram acknowledged the king's sacred office and paid tithes to him, Genesis chapter 14 and verse 18. When Joseph was elevated to a position of prominence in Egypt, he was given a wife who herself was the daughter of an Egyptian priest. Wayne Jackson, a fine Bible scholar in his own right, makes several interesting observations recorded to the matter of the phenomenon of the universal priesthood. Brother Jackson says, first, this, this historical fact reveals a worldwide recognition of the consciousness of sin in the human experience. In other words, priests developed because mankind was very acutely aware of the idea of sin. Even without a written law from God, there's an awareness of man's moral frailty. Paul recognizes this, and he says this in Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law unto themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on the day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ." Now, that's a really interesting thing for Paul to say because he's recognizing the universality of sin. Even people who are not particularly righteous recognize that something's gone terribly wrong with us as human beings. Seneca, the tutor of Nero Caesar, once wrote, All men have sinned, some more, some less. An ancient Chinese proverb says there are two good men. One is dead, the other is not yet born. Sin is a reality that simply cannot be denied. There's no one who does not sin. Every honest person, therefore, is painfully aware of his or her imperfection. Brother Jackson says, secondly, the priesthood role is also a testimony to the fact that that man feels that he is without merit to atone for his own sins. He longs for and gropes after some method for pardon, even from the darkest recesses of paganism. It's commonplace to hear of Jewish guilt, with the idea being that Jewish mothers are forever prodding their children and making them feel guilty about things. Sometimes you hear about Catholic guilt. 
I would probably suggest that some would think that there's such a thing as Church of Christ guilt. Here's the thing. Guilt is universal. Everyone with a conscience feels some degree of guilt because we have much to be guilty for because we're sinners and we fall short of God's glory. There's still, though, a third implication regarding the priesthood. And perhaps it's not without significance that in many priestly cultures, there's the practice of offering blood sacrifices for sin. In Acts 14 and verse 13, when some of the pagans there were convinced that Paul and Barnabas were divine, they were ready to offer sacrifices to them. In ancient times, some pagans even offered sacrifices of their children to their so-called gods. But the Levitical law brings to light that in the divine scheme of things, blood is a necessary component for redemption because the life of the creature is in the blood, Leviticus 17 and verse 11. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And man, by his own sin, has forfeited the right to live. The soul that sins shall die. The wages of sin, Paul says in Romans 6, is death. So priests develop because of sin, because of guilt, and because of that feeling that we need to make atonement and we need to be right with our Creator. So going back to the beginning, who were the first priests we read about in the Bible? Well, they were the patriarchs. The first period of Bible history is commonly referred to as the patriarchal age. And that term patriarch derives from two roots, meaning father rule. This was the time when fathers were the head of their families or their tribes, and they led all of those that were under their leadership. It encompasses that era between the creation events and that time when Israel was separated by God as a special nation for his own purposes. We see when Noah leaves the ark. Following the flood, he offers sacrifices on behalf of his family, Genesis 8, verses 20 and 21. Abram, after a long trek from Ur coming into Canaan, builds an altar at Shechem for his family and for himself. Job, the patriarch of Uz, offers sacrifices as the head of his family. And when Moses flees from Pharaoh into the land of Midian, he meets a tribal leader there by the name of Ruel or Jethro. You wonder where the name Jethro comes from, right there, Moses' father-in-law. And Jethro himself was a Midianite priest. Now, the priesthood that we're most familiar with in the Old Testament, and we'll see this again and again because it forms a towering presence in the history of God's people Israel, will be the Aaronic priesthood. This formal priesthood of the Mosaic Dispensation is given the name of Aaron, Moses' brother, because all of the priests were to be selected from the lineage of Aaron. Now, even though before the Aaronic priesthood develops, there seems to be some sort of priesthood even before that time. When Moses goes before Pharaoh and requests permission to take the people into the desert to have a festival for the Lord, there are priests involved with that in the sacrifice unto Jehovah that is mentioned in Exodus 5 and verse 3. Further, there are certain priests that were required to sanctify themselves in preparation for the reception of the law on Sinai. We read about this in Exodus chapter 19. Some surmise that these were tribal elders, leaders of their families, uh, Exodus 3 and 16, or else perhaps a select group of special young men, Exodus 24 and verse 5. This group might have been those firstborn that were sanctified unto the Lord, and we see later that the Levites appear to be their replacements. Instead of each family offering their firstborn son in special service to the Lord as a priest, the Levites would stand in for the entire nation in that capacity. And if you remember from Exodus chapter 32, the tribe of Levi was chosen because of its faithfulness when the rest of Israel was going off worshiping the golden calf at the base of Sinai. So when the law is given in the wilderness, Aaron and his sons were appointed to the priesthood. The role of the high priest would be a lifelong appointment. 
and would be assumed by the oldest qualified descendant of Aaron. That's one of the things that happens in the New Testament when you have confusion between uh, the high priest being Annas or being Caiaphas and different ones. There was actually the buying and selling of that office with their Roman overlords, which just absolutely outraged most of the Jewish people. But in the beginning, it would be the oldest one who would be serving as high priest, the oldest one who would be qualified. All other male offspring of Aaron would also serve as priests, except in the case of those who were physically impaired or unless they became temporarily unclean. Only the high priest would be allowed to enter the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement each year to offer up an atonement to God for the sins of the people. Now, there are some important points that stress some other great truths regarding the priesthood of the Mosaic Dispensation. Let's notice just a few of them. One, this is about the holiness of God. In the same way that John, in his lesson, talking about the Ten Commandments, points back to God, that's really what the idea of the priesthood does as well. It gives a stark contrast between a God who is unbelievably holy and a people who are unbelievably unholy. One of the prime features of the priestly system was to emphasize, and quite graphically, the absolute holy nature of Almighty God. This is a concept that again and again is reaffirmed in Scripture. If you don't understand this truth, you're going to have a very difficult time trying to draw near to God because there are so many today that see God basically as a mate or a pal or someone that we might have a, a close relationship with, but there's not a lot of difference between God and us. Friends, if the Bible's clear about anything, it's that God is nothing like us, okay? And we have strayed far, far from that ideal. And the priesthood develops because God is holy and people are not holy. Now, the priestly ministration of the law is characterized by a number of detailed regulations. You're going to get into those in your reading, particularly in the month of February. There is a lot to cover, and we can't cover all of that in just one lesson, but let's make a few generalizations about this. The high priest, along with other priests, are called upon to dress in a certain way so as to reflect the concept of holiness. In other words, this is not business as usual. They're not usual people. They are representing the people in front of a holy and divine God. Some scholars are even convinced lately of lines of evidence that indicate that in their official functions as priests, they were required to be barefoot as the token of a fact that they were serving a holy God. You recall as Moses tries to draw near to God in the form of the burning bush, he's told to take off his sandals because the ground upon which he is standing is holy. Some think that priests uh, followed through their daily ministrations barefoot. Uh, even though we, we've mentioned this once, it probably deserves mentioning again. Any of the sons of Aaron who had physical deformities of any kind were forbidden to serve as priests. Uh, as far as we understand, apparently the unblemished body of a priest was to be a visual expression of the perfection of God whom he was serving. We have the same thing, the same requirement in the form of the sacrifices. The sacrifices couldn't be animals that were halt or lame or maimed in any way, but they had to be unblemished themselves. There were certain elaborate ceremonies for the consecration of priests as they would embark on these sacred roles. The ceremonies would last for seven days. They would involve elaborate rituals involving washing with water, the adorning of special garments, being anointed with oil, the sacrifices of bullocks and rams, etc. All of this was designed to demonstrate that these men were entering the service of a most holy God. Again, there is a vast chasm between the perfect purity of our Creator and the filth of our own transgressions. 
And one of the things that we see in our daily reading as we go through the Old Testament is that these priests were standing on the front lines representing the people before a holy God, reminding them just how far they had fallen and how grievous was their sin. Now, all of this priesthood in the Old Testament is essentially pointing toward a future event, an event that continues to impact our lives even to the present moment. That is a preparation for the arrival of the great high priest. All of this in the Old Testament is preparing the people. Paul would even say the same thing about the law. He said the law is basically a schoolmaster or a pedagogue. It's a teacher leading little children along in elementary truths on their way to understanding greater truths. And the greater truth in terms of the priesthood will be Jesus Christ. He will be the one who is a priest along the order of Melchizedek who does not appear to have a beginning. He does not appear to have an end. He is a priest and he is a king at the same time. And keep in mind that Christ's reign as priest and king was never intended to be earthly. Jesus would say to Pilate, if my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would fight. But my kingdom is from another place. My kingdom is from above. Jesus also was not qualified to be a priest along the lines of Aaron because Jesus was not of the tribe of Levi, but of course of the tribe of Judah. We see this emphasized over and over again in the New Testament book of Hebrews. Hebrews basically is walking us through the law, moving us on to the law of Christ. The Aaronic priesthood moving us on to the priesthood of Christ where Jesus himself would be our high priest. The former system, Hebrews says, was carnal. The new system of Christ is heavenly. And that brings up a question. I've wondered this many times. Perhaps you have as well. Why is it that in terms of religion these days, that so many people clamor for the inferior as opposed to the superior, to the carnal versus the heavenly? You get people wanting to go back and resurrect a modern-day priesthood. We have Christ as our high priest once and for all. It's kind of the same thing in worship. I hear people all the time saying, well, you folks in churches of Christ, you just have singing. Why don't you have instruments like everyone else? They had instruments in the Old Testament. They also had animal sacrifices in the Old Testament, but I don't hear anyone asking to bring that up, at least this side of a barbecue. But the Mosaic priesthood, in some ways, pictures the Christians of the new system. You've got the tabernacle and temple arrangements where the priests perform their duties. And they are typical both of the church today and heaven. You've got the holy place and the most holy place. But those blood offerings set forth certain truths concerning him who was offered for our sins once and for all. So how wonderfully, then, the Old Testament served in preparing the way for the arrival of our high priest, Jesus, who is great, who is merciful and faithful, who is the apostle and high priest of our confession, and who serves after the order of Melchizedek, Hebrews 5 and verse 10. So what are the implications for those of us today? Well, there is such a thing as the Christian priesthood, but it's not what some people surmise. In the same way that the Levitical priests were consecrated by their office with the washing of water, even so men and women today may enter upon their priestly functions as Christians, and they do this by drawing near to God with a true heart, having their hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, their bodies washed with pure water. Obviously, a reference to baptism, Acts 22 and verse 16. The glorious message of the gospel is this, and don't miss this point. All Christians are priests, and with spiritual sacrifices we offer up to God through our high priest Jesus Christ, our acts of worship, our very lives as an act of worship, to the one who meditates and mediates on our behalf. So it's not surprising, then, that we would see references to the children of God as priests in the New Testament. 
There are several if you want to write these down and look them up on your own. There's 1 Peter 2 and verse 5, also verse 9. Revelation 1 and verse 6. Revelation 5 and verse 10. And finally, Revelation 20 and verse 6. So why is there so much confusion then? about priesthood? Well, because there are different religious traditions, there are different churches that teach differing ideas about the priesthood. I would say even false ideas about the priesthood because they do not jibe with the teachings of the New Testament. What would be a few of those? Well, let's list three uh, for your consideration. One, there is the notion in Catholicism that the priests are the successors of the apostles. The Roman Catholic idea of a physical uh, priesthood to, for today's church simply doesn't have any support in the New Testament. It's based on a mistaken notion that the apostles were clothed with the powers of Jesus Christ and that the Catholic priests, as successors of the apostles, are similarly endowed with their power. That's one of the reasons that only a priest uh, can preside at the Mass in Catholicism, because as the bread is held aloft and certain words are said, the bread is said to become the literal flesh of Jesus. Again, the Scriptures don't teach that, but Catholicism is at least consistent. If this is happening, then the priest has to be the one uh, to be the one driving that, even though the New Testament doesn't teach it. Then there's the notion in Mormonism of two distinct priesthoods. The Mormons promote the Aaronic priesthood and also the Melchizedek priesthood. Now, you need to go back no further to May the 15th, 1829, when Joseph Smith Jr., the author of the Book of Mormon and the founder of that faith, declared these two priesthoods. But once again, the Melchizedek priesthood belonged to Christ and to Christ alone until the end of time. The writer of Hebrews says this in chapter 7 and verse 24, that Jesus, that because he abides forever, his priesthood is unchangeable. That does not apply to any people, Mormon or otherwise. Second, the Aaronic priesthood that the Mormons teach cannot be operative today because it was an integral part of the law of Moses, which was abolished by Christ, Ephesians 2.15, in her manner of speaking, being nailed to the cross. Besides that, the only way that the Aaronic priesthood would continue is to have a record of who was of the tribe of Levi. And these would be Mormons and not Jews, so that doesn't figure at all anyway. And then there's one more notion. There is premillennialism's idea of a restored Aaronic priesthood. We won't go into all of the ins and outs of the premillennial system, but suffice it to say that the Aaronic priesthood in the minds of those that believe this is to be resumed nationally on behalf of the Gentiles in the millennial kingdom. In other words, when Jesus comes down here and he fights Gog and Magog and there's the battle of Armageddon and the blood is as high as the horse's bridles, that after Jesus vanquishes every foe and sets up his kingdom headquartered in Jerusalem and he will live and reign with his people for a thousand years, then there's going to be a resumed priesthood. Well, you know what you need to know about premillennialism. It's what Marshall Keeble, the great evangelist, said. Pre means before. Millennial means a thousand. Ism means it ain't true. So there's no ironic priesthood that's going to be developing in a millennial kingdom, which by itself will not exist. So what is the conclusion that we can have? I know this has been a lot of information, probably akin to trying to take a drink of water out of a fire hydrant. Let's conclude thusly. We live today under a different system. It's a superior system, according to the gospel writers, according to the Hebrews writer, than the old system. The old system of the Aaronic priesthood was to convince people of sin to show them the gravity of the consequences of sin, and to prepare a people who would be receptive to receive the new high priest, Jesus, the Son of God. We live in that time. The New Testament says that every Christian, male and female alike, are priests with Jesus as our high priest. 
That has all kinds of implications uh, for us today. In the old system, you could only come to God approaching him through a priest. Today, you approach God through the high priest, Jesus Christ. Today, you have access to the word of God. You can pray. You can confess your sins. You can teach the faith that you believe to someone else. You don't have to have a representative. You don't have to have the vicar of Christ on earth. God has made us into a kingdom of priests with Jesus as our high priest. And that's a special, special blessing when you think about it. Anytime that you have a need, anytime that you have a longing, a yearning to be closer to God, you can simply approach God through the high priest Jesus. What a blessing that is. We hope you'll continue to stay with your reading. Keep in mind what the concept of the priesthood was designed to to accomplish in the first place. It was to make intercession on behalf of the people to God. It was to remind us of our sinfulness and God's utter holiness. Let's go to him through our high priest Jesus in prayer. Our Father, we realize what a blessed people we are, that there were many who lived in in centuries and millennia gone by who longed to see the things that we have access to in the New Testament. Father, one of the things that we have access to is that we can approach your throne of grace at any time through our high priest, Jesus the Messiah. Father, help us to pursue lives of holiness. Help us to be obedient. Help us to be those who have a strong and vibrant faith not in ourselves, but in you, in your goodness, and in your glory. Father, continue to be with us in this program of Through the Bible in One Year. Help us to be diligent and faithful in our reading, and we pray that you will grant us a blessing of insight, of knowledge, and of understanding as we seek to know you and your word better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.